Hi, so my name is Jennifer Hayashi, and I am a postdoc in Melanie Ott's lab here at the Gladstone Institutes right across the street. Um, and so the Ott lab has historically had a huge interest in viruses and lipids. Um, and so one of the first things we noticed during the coronavirus, oh, oh no, that's the wrong button, sorry. Okay, fast forward, sorry. One of the first observations that was made during the pandemic was a severe co uh, comorbidity for patients was obesity. And so obese, obese patients were more likely to have uncontrolled viremia and increased hospitalization compared to non-obese patients. And so one of the first sets of experiments that we did was a collaboration with Andreas Pushnik at the Biohub. And we did a genome wide CRISPR screen of SARS-CoV-2 in addition to two common cold coronaviruses, 229E, um, and OC43. And so we're looking for host factors that are required for each of these viruses' infections. Um, and in collaboration with Medi and the Krogan Lab, oh, sorry, uh, we performed a network analysis uh, study in the sense that we can take these individual data sets and instead of looking for individual hits, look for common pathways that are used by all three viruses. And it turns out that one of these pathways was the cholesterol metabolic pathway. Um, and so us and others did performed f uh, confirmatory knockdown studies, um, and it turns out when you get rid of these genes, you do in fact decrease coronaviral infection. Um, but again, we were kind of interested in this obesity phenotype, and so we were looking for a system that more mimicked um, obesity in a tissue culture setting. And so in this case, what we're doing is we are adding low-density lipoprotein or circulating LDL complexes to the system. Um, that is, it's uh, very similar to a patient who is obese who often has increased circulating cholesterol. And we asked, how does this increased cholesterol um, affect viral infection? So on the left, what we're doing is we have, oops, sorry, we have our untreated sample um, plus minus virus, and in the, the middle panel, we have our plus minus virus plus um, LDL. And we're counting our infected cells by double-stranded posi uh, double RNA positive cells in green. Um, and in the center, we are quantifying the fact that in the presence of additional LDL to the system, we get an increase of infection. And now, you're, you might be thinking, maybe it's just any lipid. If you were to fatten a cell, maybe the virus would just do better intrinsically because it's an envelope uh, virus. But it turns out, if you add a free fatty acid, oleic acid, which is a precursor to triglycerides, you actually don't see that effect. So it does seem to be LDL specific. Okay. Um, we then looked at to see how other variants respond to this LDL. Do they have the same response or not? And it turns out they each kind of respond slightly differently. Uh, Omicron on our far right has the least response uh, that we noticed, um, but specifically or uniquely the beta variant had a very strong response to LDL. Um, just as a note, the beta variant is also one of the most pathogenic variants out there um, when seen in patients. And so we're going to keep beta variants in mind uh, for the rest of the talk. Okay, correct button. Okay, and so we've been talking about LDL, but we do need to take a second about how LDL gets into the cell. Um, and so LDLR, ooh, sorry, this LDLR is the primary receptor for LDL uptake. It's a transmembrane protein that, like other transmembrane proteins, is made in the ER transport it through the Golgi where it's heavily glycosylated to make a, a mature form on the plasma membrane. Um, and so we're going to keep maturation in mind. Um, once LDLR is bound to an LDL, it's endocytosed, that endosome deacidifies, and, or sorry, acidifies, and this is important because this acidification causes a conformational change to release the LDL from its receptor, but also to allow the hydrolysis of the LDL into free cholesterol. Right, so then it can be used for cellular purposes. Um, I have highlighted two proteins here that are also very essential for this process, which are two cholesterol sh uh, chaperone proteins, um, because otherwise you can't have free cholesterol in your cell. You need those guys. Um, <laughs> and, but what we wanted to do was uh, to see, we know that the virus benefits from increased extracellular cholesterol, but does that increased extracellular cholesterol end up in the cell? And so in this case, we're using a fluorescent LDL um, particle called di-LDL, um, this guy here. Um, and we can measure how much of this fluorescence ends up inside the cell. And on the right, what we've done, again, is looked at the relative fluorescence between uninfected and infected cells. And we can see that there's about a 25% increase in LDL uptake alone. Um, 
But because we want to know how is the virus doing this, it appears that there's some viral mechanism that's increasing our cholesterol uptake. Uh, we individually expressed our SARS-CoV-2 proteins, used that same assay as before, our fluorescent LDL, and asked do any of them induce cholesterol uptake. And it turns out, as highlighted in our red box on the right, we have ORF3A. Um, and so we asked ourselves, what the heck is ORF3A? And so ORF3A is a small transmembrane protein. It makes up a homotetrameric viral porin that deacidifies endosomes. It's also considered a major pathogenesis factor. One interactome study actually identified it as an interactor of LDLR, our primary receptor for LDL in, um, intake, suggesting, right, that's a potential mechanism. And so, of course, we wanted to confirm that this interaction was real. And so when we co-express ORF3A, ORF3A and LDLR on the far right, we actually see that these larger bands are enriching relative to our empty vector samples, suggesting that our ORF3A is doing something with LDLR to enrich for that. In addition to that, as we hoped, um, we were able to confirm that in the absence of ORF3A, we do not pull down LDLR, but in the presence of ORF3A and LDLR, we are able to pull down both, so confirming the interaction, but also, again, we're getting these more mature forms of the protein. Um, so now we're gonna take our two clues from before. The fact that ORF3A seems to be the causative protein of this um, phenomenon, but also the fact that the beta variant was the most sensitive to our system. And so it turns out the beta variant has unique mutations in it, and it's ORF3A, sorry. Um, it has Q57H and S171L. And so what we then did was we asked ourselves, do these point mutations, or does the beta variant ORF3A have a different phenotypic effect compared to the wild type ORF3A? And so here what we're doing is we're expressing our wild type ORF3A compared to our empty vector, and we're asking, are the endosomes acidified, right? Because previously it had been published that ORF3A deacidifies endosomes. And so, as you can see, um, we get a decrease in acidification, which is great, we confirm their results. It turns out when we express our beta variant or 3A, we get a restoration, if not an augmentation of acidification, um, and that the individual point mutants also seem to restore this phenotype, suggesting that, again, there's something about the or 3A beta variant viral porin that is restoring acidification. Now, we're virologists, so we wanna know those that previous experiment sorry, was done in individual protein expression. Now what we're doing is we've taken our infectious clone system and made modifications just to ORF3A. Um, and so in this case, we can see that our wild type infectious clone does respond to LDL as expected. When we make the mutations just to add the beta variant, we do again see an increase, or we see, a, sorry, we see a minor increase in um, sensitivity to uh, LDL. As, and we see the same phenotype in our two point mutants. Again, this is in an infectious clone setting where just the ORF3A is modified. Um, and then finally, what kind of really made us happy was the fact that if you were to add a stop codon in ORF3A and prevent its expression during infection, you do not get a response to LDL, suggesting that ORF3A is our causative, um, causative factor for our phenotype. Okay, and so we have our working model where this, this hopefully looks familiar, um, where you have your LDLR, uh, bind your LDL, acidify and release its free cholesterol for cellular uses. Great, that's in a healthy cell. It seems like um, in the presence of SARS-CoV-2, specifically wild type ORF3A, ORF3A interacts with LDLR and somehow is, de or is de deacidifying the endosome but is somehow then sequestering our cholesterol, potentially slowing, slowing the kinetics of LDL hydrolysis. Um, but using our variants, what we can, or our variant, what we can see is that ORF3A seems to have restored this hydrolysis process, potentiating why the virus is doing better in a high cholesterol setting. What I mean by that is, like our wild type, you have our interaction with LDLR, but in this case, we have our increase of acidification, so you're getting increased release of your LDL from its receptor, but also hydrolysis and release of the cholesterol for cellular uses. Um, and so that would suggest that we are enhancing our LDL hydrolysis. Um, and of course, 
science, we always have additional questions to keep going, but we have many things um, to ask, such as, is the viral porn function required for the LDL uptake? Is the ORF3A and the beta variant different uh, structurally uh, than the um, wild type? Um, we don't know how ORF3A is enriching for our more mature LDLR. And then also, what happens to this LDL that is seemingly either slowly hydrolyzed, uh, hydrolyzed or is somehow trapped in our endosome? And so this is where we are at in our project. And um, with all science, it's done not in a vacuum. Um, we have lots of BSL-3 work done uh, in this project, and I want to thank our lab and others um, for their efforts. Um, quick question about uh, maybe the step of the viral life cycle. Um, were you able to, like, I, I guess the mechanism you're proposing would be kind of like at the stage of replication. Like, like is, you can show that it's not entry, it is focused on replication? Yeah, so we've actually done the individual assays to measure the effect of LDL on entry, genomic replication, egress, and exit. And it turns out, as you predicted, it's, it's at the genomic replication stage. Okay, very cool. Um, uh, yeah, kind of just a follow-up question, but how does, I guess you're kind of alluding to free cholesterol, like how does free cholesterol potentiate the effect that you're talking about? Yeah, so um, one thing that I should mention that we didn't go over is that your cells can regulate cholesterol in two ways. One way is to de novo synthesize it in the ER, and the other is to take it up through circulating complexes. I um, mean, it turns out the lungs rely 80% of their cholesterol is from LDL particles. So the idea would be that when you are increasing your membrane surfaces during a viral infection, the cell is already dependent on LDL, and so increasing that uptake in hydrolysis would then allow for better infection. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask, since this is like a variant, uh, it changes for these different variants, do you see any correlation between the cholesterol levels in the cells that are typically infected by these different variants, or maybe like the dynamics of these different variants? Meaning like the cellular cholesterol of each variant? Yeah, or? just like uh, if you look at the cholesterol levels in cells that are um, more susceptible to infection by these different variants. You kind of alluded to it with the beta variant being more pathogenic. So yeah, do you see correlation between the pathogenicity and the cholesterol level of cells that are being infected? Um, so I don't have the exact numbers on the pathogenicity correlation. I can tell you that cells that are infected with SARS-CoV-2 actually increase their intracellular cholesterol. And we've done studies on that. So potentially if something like the beta variant is both increasing uptake and hydrolysis, we would see a, a greater increase as well. Cool. Thank you. Maybe just to follow up on that. Um, so you would think that in a population where we have such obesity that, that these variants, like the beta variant, the substitutions would actually be selected for. So do you have a hypothesis for why they haven't been selected for? And then I have a follow-up question to that. Um, so as far as the beta variant is concerned, um, my understanding is that it actually didn't spread super far worldwide um, to where, sorry, but more obesity is prevalent suggesting that it wasn't necessarily um, selected for internationally, um, but also that being that it was more pathogenic, I, my understanding is that it burned out a bit faster um, too. So it's not really circulating right now. And I guess to follow up on that, um, I'd be remiss, I spent 13 years at Regeneron to not ask about PCSK9 inhibitors. And so have you thought about using that as a control in some of your experiments um, around LDL? Right, so to follow up on this, P PCSK9 is an accessory protein to LDLR, um, and uh, pharmaceutical companies have created inhibitors to them to increase LDLR presentation at the cell surface, just so we're all on the same page. Um, we haven't followed up with it, but it, we have the reagents and just need to do the experiments. Oh, awesome. Thank yeah. you. Okay, I think we stop here. <laughs> Thank you very much.